Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10th Brown Bag Summer Series, the biopsychosocial model in promoting equitable care at the University of Rochester Medical Center. My name is Zena Schuber, Director of Community Relations for the Department of Psychiatry. I'm filling in today for Telva Ovalaris. Today's presentation and all the remaining presentations of the series have been scheduled for an hour and a half, that is from noon to 1.30. At one o'clock, those of you who would like to continue the discussion of this topic will be ushered into a breakout room, um, minus the coffee and cookies. An ASL interpreter will also be available during our breakout sessions. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to highlight that our department will be hosting the 26th Congress of the International College of Psychosomatic Medicine right here in Rochester in person on September 7th through 9th. We invite you to join us at the Rochester Convention Center as we explore the past, present, and future of the biopsychosocial model that's in practice throughout the world. Today, I want to remind you that this is a webinar, of course, and we invite everyone to and, and encourage you to put in your questions in the Q&A section. These will be answered immediately after the presentation or in our breakout room. Towards the end of the hour, we will put the link in the chat for you to fill out an evaluation to receive CME credits. And now we are excited to present our Brown Bag series this year on the 75th anniversary of our department and to share this platform with colleagues from the Department of Medicine, Wilmont Cancer Center, the School of Nursing, Neurology, Pediatrics, and our colleagues from the Office of Patient Experience. Health is a result of many factors, the biological processes of our body, our emotional states, and the social context in which we live. Rochester, as many of you know, is the birthplace of the biopsychosocial model, a model that considers how these factors interact and influence the health, how we view health and illness. In recognition of our department's 75th anniversary, we invite you to join us in celebrating by honoring the work of the, of the department's great change agents, Dr. Engel and Dr. Romano. This week's brown bag is presented by the School of Nursing, and it is my great privilege to introduce Mitchell Warren, Wharton, Associate Professor of Clinical Nursing and the Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion, who will set the stage for today's brown bag. Please join me in welcoming Mitchell Ward. Thank you, Zina, and thank you to the DICE Committee for allowing the School of Nursing to present some of the great work that we've been doing here as it relates to the biopsychosocial model and is in how we promote equitable care at URMC and abroad. I'm delighted to present to you my esteemed colleague, Dr. Erin Baylor, um, and some of the phenomenal work that she's been doing. I'm going to read a brief bio of Dr. Baylor and then turn it over to her so that we can get the presentation started. Dr. Baylor has been with the university since 1992, where she started as a registered nurse and then worked for 12, 10 years as a pediatric nurse practitioner in pediatric hematology oncology before joining the School of Nursing faculty. She's been the director of the Pediatric Nurse Practitioner Program for 10 years and is the inaugural director of the Simulation and Experiential Learning at the School of Nursing. Erin earned her doctorate in nursing practice in 2013, where she implemented an evidence-based debriefing training program to empower faculty to facilitate critical thinking in nursing students. Dr. Baylor has presented nationally on topics of experiential learning, evidence-based teaching, simulation, and professional role development of nurses for more than a decade. In addition to her primary faculty and leadership roles here in the School of Nursing, Dr. Baylor maintains a maintains primary care appointment at English Road Pediatrics. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Baylor. Thank you, Mitchell. Um, I am going to start by sharing my screen. All right. Um, I 
am so humbled to have the opportunity to present to all of you today on some of uh, the work that we have done here at the School of Nursing uh, around bridging some gaps that we discovered um, in our curricular uh, content around vulnerable populations. And I think we may have worked under an assumption that students receive some of this education in their clinical um, practicums, right, in their, in their rotations, and, and discovered that perhaps we weren't doing enough to really prepare them to be change makers um, in whatever setting they practice clinically. So I'll kind of get started here a little bit with uh, the background of how we came to be implementing a poverty simulation here at the school. Um, we, you know, as you could guess from the, the, my background, as Dr. Wharton uh, described, you know, I have a, a, a passion for simulation and experiential learning. And so when we discovered here at the school that there was some gaps in how students were learning this content, I naturally um, want to solve all problems with um, developing a simulation. And so I was really grateful that the faculty that teach in these programs were willing to um, allow me the opportunity to work with them to establish this simulation because I felt that content such as this would be delivered in a much more powerful format if students uh, could get a, a taste or a glimpse of what it might be like to be very vulnerable out in the community. And that it would be a lot more powerful than say them, you know, uh, reading off of a PowerPoint slide about how poverty affects, um, you know, the, the very people that we serve in our communities. So um, I did a little bit of research and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the simulation that we do. Um, with first, and I'll, and I'll reference this a few times throughout this talk, with credit to the uh, Missouri Community Action Network. They were the ones who developed this simulation and we purchased the simulation uh, kit with all of the sort of participant roles in the different areas of the community. Uh, so um, many schools um, and uh, healthcare organizations around the country have utilized uh, this simulation from the Missouri Community Action Network. So um, it was it was a great investment for us here at the School of Nursing, for sure. Um, all right, let's dive into it a little bit. I thought it would be important as we begin this conversation to sort of first examine our own biases around poverty. So I know this isn't an interactive uh, discussion here that in the webinar format, I can't really hear what visualizations are coming to each of your minds, but I would like you to sort of picture for a moment what you imagine when you think of a child that's living in poverty. Did some of you picture something like this? A, a brown skinned child that appears very sad, uh, perhaps dirty. Um, that's a pretty powerful image, right? Did anyone think of poverty maybe looking a little bit more like this? I think it's just important that we think about what comes to mind when we're talking about uh, vulnerable populations. Um, you know, next, maybe think about where where do people in poverty live? What do their neighborhoods look like, right? If you do a quick Google search, you'll see pictures like this. Um, but people who are struggling with some of the um, social and emotional and physical challenges of poverty also live in neighborhoods that maybe look like this, right? If we think about what, what do families in poverty go through? What is their day-to-day -day life look like? Some people might picture something like this, appears to be someone who could be homeless, um, but it could also be something like this, right? My goal here is to kind of help you to realize that poverty can look like a lot of different things and that it's, it's important for all of us to be able to assess what kinds of challenges the clients that we serve might be facing. 
Um, I also want to think about who, who else in the community could be very vulnerable or perhaps struggling with some of the issues around poverty. Maybe people who are disabled. This, this person appears to be in a wheelchair, maybe, maybe a, a veteran from one of the armed services. About recent college graduates, right? Leaving college with a lot of debt, perhaps not being able to get a job that allows them to be able to afford adequate housing or food um, and um, cause them to, to really get into a cycle where poverty could start impacting other areas of their life. So I just wanted to start with that. And, and hopefully all of you can sort of take that in and do your own self-assessment um, about some of the biases that I think exist around poverty. Um, I can share very briefly a, um, a story that I, I grew up in a very middle-class family and um, my, my father had a, a pretty decent job and there was six of us kids. So his, his job was able to support the family of eight. And, um, and then when I was a child, he died very suddenly. And all of a sudden we had a family of seven and my mom wasn't working at the time because she was raising all of us kids. And that uh, triggered my oldest brother to have to drop out of college and work to help you know, support the family. And my mom worked two minimum wage jobs to try to keep us in our home. She was not successful. We had to leave our home. Um, and so, you know, I think of sometimes poverty for some people can be just maybe one diagnosis away, right? So as, as we think about the clients that we serve in the community, we certainly don't wanna be making assumptions that everyone in poverty looks like this initial picture of this very sad, um, dirty, perhaps unclothed um, child. All right, so I'm gonna walk you through sort of what our um, journey has been to getting to this simulation and how we've integrated this in our curriculum. Um, our plan was to have a very experiential approach. So it wasn't just let's give the students an article to read, show them a PowerPoint, and then have them do this sim, right? We, we wanted them to really um, have some meaningful learning opportunities throughout this curriculum. So we started with um, pre-learning and you know the pre-learning included talking about vulnerable populations you know what does it mean uh, for those that have privilege and how how might um, you know our students as nurses and healthcare providers um, perhaps be change agents right in thinking about access to health care food housing um, and so forth so they, they, we had case studies in class. Um, students were given some fairly provocative uh, scenarios that they had to contemplate how they would be able to help um, empower some change. And then we had them go out into the community. And students were working in small groups. They were given a zip code in which they had to go to that zip code and examine things like, you know, what, what healthcare, childcare, employment, uh, grocery stores. So there's a lot of food deserts right here in Rochester, right? Um, what was the housing like? Uh, what about transportation? Was there easy access to a bus line that could then get them to work, schools, childcare, healthcare, um, you know, pharmacies, and so forth? Um, so I want to share a couple of powerful things that our students learned during this uh, portion of the exercise. Um, students discovered that, I'm going to give uh, two examples here, that those that were assigned the zip code 14534, which some of you may recognize is the zip code for Pittsford, um, that uh, members of the community living in that zip code had not only multiple opportunities for food, health care, urgent care, and so forth, um, but the life expectancy was 81.8 years for members of that community. Go 20 minutes away to a different zip code in Rochester, uh, 14604, and there was a very different um, experience for those students that found that there was 
um, unsafe areas, that being able to walk to school was very challenging for a lot of children, um, that parents did not have access to a lot of daycare options, uh, which limited their ability to work. Um, there was significant food uh, desert areas where there would be nothing on public transportation to be able to uh, get members of this community, um, you know, to having access to healthy foods. They might be have access to like a mini mart, but nowhere that would sell a lot of fresh produce, for example. Um, in that zip code, 14604, the average life expectancy was 68.5 years. That's pretty powerful, right? A 20 minute drive results in greater than 13 years less in life expectancy. So students were already kind of really impacted by some of this learning before they even got to the simulation. They had a little bit of an idea about what some of those determinants of health were and how just where you lived and what you had access to really impacted that. So next comes the poverty simulation, which is really what I am gonna talk most about here, I promise. Um, the poverty simulation, um, and we're gonna get into some very specifics about it on the next slide, um, but is basically the way it runs is the students are there for about three and a half hours. Um, we transform our School of Nursing here in Helenwood Hall into a community. So I will say this takes a significant amount of legwork and preparation. Um, so I have a fantastic and really dedicated team of people that are all in to help uh, transform our school into what will feel like an authentic community uh, for, the, for the learners as they participate in the simulation. Um, the, our students arrive and they have a 30 minute pre-brief. And in that pre-brief, we sort of talk about the humility that is expected for participants um, to have when they approach this learning activity, that it is not a game, that this is somebody's reality, and that very well, many of the other people in the room during the pre-brief have experienced poverty firsthand. Um, we acknowledge that there could be some triggers that would come up for those that have experienced some of the um, very devastating consequences of being in poverty. So we really wanted to kind of frame the activity in a way that um, students weren't arriving and thinking that this was really funny. Um, that although we acknowledge that some people when they're nervous, they giggle or laugh, that that's a really common um, response when you're feeling uncomfortable but that they needed to have a deeper awareness and appreciation for the reality that this is for many people. So the pre-brief really focused a lot on, on sort of creating a psychologically safe environment for all participants um, to be in during the simulation. The simulation then itself lasts about two hours. And what it is, is it's, it's simulating one month of poverty. So each week is 20 minutes so that we, we have timers that go off and students have 20 minutes to go through what would be a week and try to survive um, with the income that they have, the resources that they have. And they're also exposed to a lot of challenges um, that many people in poverty face on a daily basis. So challenges around transportation, challenges around utilities getting shut off, uh, challenges around having to leave work to pick up a sick child um, and get them to a healthcare provider to get a note, to get them back to school, and now they've missed a bunch of work, right? So all, all of those kinds of challenges they're faced with. Um, they have then five minutes in between each week to simulate out their weekend. And in that weekend, they have time as a family to sort of regroup, talk about what their strategies might be. And it's very interesting over the four weeks to see how students um, approach each week, it changes. They become very stressed. Uh, things become quite chaotic. We find that um, not just adults, but even children, um, you know, simulated children in the simulation make very different choices. Choices that they might have thought of um, in a really negative way, like 
um, things like stealing or skipping school to be able to help watch a sibling at home while the mom is at work or, or so forth. Um, so we see their, their, their needs change, their priorities change, and they become quite desperate by about the middle of week three. Um, so, so the simulation then ends at about two hours, and then we have a one hour debrief. And um, those of you, uh, including uh, Dr. Wharton, but those of you who have participated in this know that that debrief could be, it could be the rest of the afternoon. We now provide lunch so that students can really have time to process what they've experienced in the simulation. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that the debrief ends up being um, a really powerful discussion on sharing of ideas, but more importantly, how some uh, prejudices, how some unconscious biases, how some assumptions um, really changed as a result of being uh, a part of the simulation. And then of course we do a post-assessment. So we, we do some pre-assessment data, we collect some post-assessment data, um, and I'll share that data uh, with you. Um, but the biggest thing that we're really sort of looking at over the course of this curriculum, so not just the simulation, but the entire curriculum, is a change in their knowledge, right? Their, their knowledge about poverty, their knowledge about risk factors, their awareness about how poverty and being in a, in a very unstable or vulnerable um, member of the community can really put you at very high risk for a lot of things. Um, and this is where the biopsychosocial model probably comes in, right? Looking at our clients as whole people and thinking about how one aspect of a person's health can really trickle and have very lasting and very powerful implications for their overall well being and quality of life. Um, I would say the biggest thing, and this is, I'll, I'll share this data with you, that the most powerful thing has been how their assumptions changed. The, the assumptions that they had before these learning activities and then their assumptions after the simulation are significantly uh, different. Um, and so that's been pretty powerful to see. Um, so I know I've already given some details about the simulation, um, but I thought I would talk a little bit about how, uh, what, what is included in the kit like that we purchased from the Missouri Community Action Network. It literally is two giant totes, like very, very large totes, full of props and signs and name tags of the each member of the community. How So some of the families, for example, might be um, a, a single elderly individual living alone in the community, having very little resources and in, in what that is like for an older adult in the community living in poverty. Uh, another might be a, a single parent family uh, with young children. Others might be a couple that is just trying to start out and get jobs and pay off some student loans. Um, so there's quite a diverse range of members of the community that the students are able to um, experience and see how they interact with each other. Um, there's a variety of different community agencies, organizations uh, that are set up as part of the community. So there's you know, social services, there's childcare, there's banks and mortgage companies, there's quick cash ATM. Of course, there's the public transportation. So anywhere they need to get in the community, they need to have um, a transportation token to get them there. So it is collected uh, when they arrive to work or when they arrive to the grocery store or you know, when they arrive to pick up their child from daycare. Uh, we have a school that is set up for the kids to come to. Um, in the in the community, there's homeless shelters. Uh, there's different uh, faith community organizations. Uh, we have employment agencies uh, and employers where students can go to look for a job, and then when they get a job, to you know clock in and clock out. Um, and then other so this simulation uh, it takes about twenty volunteers to be able to be the 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 people in the community that are facilitating all of these different agencies. 
So, you know, one volunteer is a grocer, then we have a chaplain, we have police officers, we have child protective workers, we have rent collectors, um, and, and so on and so on. So there's, it, it takes quite a lot of volunteers to do this. We've been extremely lucky at the School of Nursing that our faculty and staff have been very gracious to volunteering three hours of their time each time we do this uh, to, to make this a really meaningful experience for our learners. Um, I would say, um, based on my experience, we've run this simulation four times now at the school. Uh, I think it would be helpful for all employees, all staff, all faculty, um, you know, to be able to um, experience this um, at least once. It's, it's eye-opening. Even if you think you know all that you need to know about poverty and the implications that that has for our most vulnerable members of the community, um, I can promise you that this simulation would, would definitely open your eyes uh, to things that you hadn't even thought about or didn't know you didn't know, so. All right, so some people might be thinking, wow, so this takes what, like 12 hours to set up this community, it takes 20 volunteers. She had to pay $3,000 to purchase the kit. Wouldn't it just be easier to have, you know, a discussion in class and maybe do some case studies and just leave it at that? Do a pre and post quiz to make sure that they understand what they need to know? Um, why a simulation when this is a huge lift to be able to deliver to our learners? Um, so our initial, uh, when, we, when we started this, our initial thought was that this would be a really great way for students to experience um, the challenges and the barriers and that they would perhaps leave with a deeper understanding about poverty. There was also some pretty like impressive unintended consequences, things that we couldn't have even anticipated. Um, and that was how powerful and moving of an experience this was for our learners. Um, I, I will humbly admit I underestimated the impact that this would have on our students and how it would change their perceptions to think much more broader and much more globally. Um, so here are some of the things that students have said they have gotten out of this simulation. It's broadened their perspectives. It's helped them to analyze the barriers that exist in the community, things that they had no idea existed. A lot of them have said it has empowered them to become advocates, that they understand privilege a whole lot better. They thought they knew, but they didn't. And now they, now they seem to get it. How important it is for us to explore resources so that we can help the people that we serve have access to resources that could improve their quality of life, reduce some of the you know, burdens on their health and so forth. Examine the biases, because we all have them, right? So taking a deeper look at what some of the biases are, um, students are able to really reflect on that in a pretty powerful way. Psychological safety, right? We wanted this sim to be a, a safe learning activity uh, where students would not feel in any way um, judged or marginalized. We wanted to make sure that this was a safe space for students to be able to ask questions and admit that they didn't understand and explore why maybe they came into um, you know, the simulation having some of these underlying um, assumptions and biases. We talk about changing policies, you know, in, in uh, my current uh, practice as a nurse practitioner, um, and, and I've seen this before, and I'm sure many of you can relate, there was a policy about if uh, a patient was more than 10 minutes late for their appointment, then the appointment got canceled automatically, they wouldn't be seen. And I have my students take the bus to one of their clinical 
um, settings so that they can see how challenging it can be to rely on public transportation to get you to a scheduled appointment and how sometimes it is completely out of a uh, patient or parent's control to get there on time when the buses are running late, right? So that's just a very small example of how a policy might get changed as a result of somebody understanding uh, the, the resources and the barriers that exist in the community. Challenge assumptions, and we're going to talk more about this because this was probably, um, if there was a number one thing that the simulation has achieved for our learners, it's to really have them challenge some of the assumptions that they have. Develop empathy. You know, I always say empathy is a hard thing to teach, right? But sometimes we learn it um, through through life you know, when we, when we struggle with something and we develop greater empathy because of that. So I always say that nurses who have been a patient probably have a lot of empathy from that patient perspective, right? Um, so I, I think experiencing this increased students having a lot more empathy and a lot less judgment. Um, it, you know, for our learners, they are, they are in school to become nurses nurse practitioners, nurse educators, clinical nurse leaders. And so for them to have these experiences and how this will impact a client's health was quite powerful as well. We've already talked about barriers, but um, understanding them a little bit better. And then most importantly, being a part of the solution, right? This is a, this is a complex problem and we all can contribute to having ideas and changing policies about how to be a part of the solution. So I wanted to give a few examples of the kinds of families that the students are assigned to be a part of in the simulation. So I have um, six different examples here. Um, you know, single parent with limited resources, no transportation, they have to figure out how to get to work, Childcare, daycare, school, all, all of those things. Um, elderly person must find a way to pay for both utilities and medications. And that was something that students often reflected on. I had to decide whether I was gonna eat or get this prescription filled that wasn't covered. I had to eat. So I had to say, I'm not gonna fill this prescription. It challenges students from using words like non-compliant, Right? So when we think of a patient as being non-compliant, that word is just, it's a pet peeve for me. Um, but I always think about, I wonder what's going on. I bet you there's more to this story than the patient chose to not make their health a priority, right? So what, what were the barriers that existed for this client or this family? And really exploring that a little bit, that it might be that the medication that I prescribed was too expensive and it wasn't covered by their insurance. So it wasn't really non-compliance, it was that it, there just wasn't enough money to get the medication. And so as a provider, I need to know that so I can prescribe a different um, medication for that, for that patient. Um, individuals with chronic health issues that really can't afford to take time off of work for all of the follow-up care or preventative visits. One of the areas in the community is a health clinic and of all of the areas that we have a volunteer place to facilitate this simulation, the person who is the most bored is the healthcare provider at the clinic. Nobody has time to prioritize their healthcare. They're struggling to survive. And so that's a, that's a really powerful, people, a powerful message for the people to participate or to, to learn through participation that sometimes healthcare just isn't as high on Maslow's hierarchy of needs when they have just been evicted from their home, their utilities are shut off. They now have a child with a chronic health condition issue and so forth. So um, we have young adults that are caring for their younger siblings while a parent is incarcerated um, or grandparents that are raising their grandchildren um, even though they're struggling with their own um, finances, healthcare, um, employment issues, and so forth. Um, you know, one of the things that we learned from students that participated was that they didn't realize how much poverty impacted children. That they thought that 
at least children were, you know, they were given meals at school. Um, you know, there's free well visits for kids. They had no idea the hard choices that children in the community had to make to help support their families um, and how ashamed they felt to be at school and not have the same school supplies that their classmates had or that they didn't have the money for the field trip um, or that they didn't even have shoes that fit. Uh, so it made them realize some of the shame that uh, members of the community who are living in poverty um, likely feel. So the biggest, as I mentioned, kind of unintended benefits or consequences of the simulation was students really um, learning about uh, becoming more aware, um, having much greater humility and developing empathy. And so, you know, I have a few pictures of what, of what this looks like where um, students have to, um, you know, sort of negotiate. We only have this much money. Our rent is due. We have no food. The utilities are about to be shut off. What do we, what do we do? And a teenager says, you know what? I think I can go steal some stuff from the pawn shop and then resell that. And that should be enough to get some groceries. Now, students who do that would have never thought that that would have been a choice that they would have made right, until they were in the situation where they had to make some of these hard decisions. Um, so it's a very moving experience. Um, and they really do have to face some of these very harsh realities that um, people in, in very vulnerable um, populations, whether it be because of health issues or just based on their income or where they live, right, that, that 20 minute drive from having one zip code versus another, um, how that would really impact them. Many of our participants have said that uh, this, being a part of this has really motivated them to wanna to take action, um, whether that be changing policies or volunteering in the community, uh, but they wanted to be able to make a difference. And if you think about, so I, so far, we have had 300, approximately 300 nursing students participate in this simulation. And almost all of them left saying, I wanna make a difference. I know I'm only one person, but I wanna make a difference. Now that I know better, I need to do better. So imagine, you know, the, the, the return on investment. You know, have, have I recouped the time and money that we have spent to provide this? Probably not, but the return on investment has been each individual that goes through this wanting to make a difference, wanting to do more, having much more empathy and feeling empowered to know how and what to advocate for. So I'll take it. That's a great ROI for my standpoint. All right. I just want to walk through sort of some of our pre and post assessments. Um, I, I would like to preface this slide with um, a disclosure that um, I have a doctorate in nursing practice, not a PhD. So I, I did not think to elicit the help of a statistician here. So I had to display the, the data that I had in the most meaningful way, but I, I don't have um, a lot of statistical data to share. Um, really the most important pieces of data that I wanted to share were some of the changes and assumptions, and then sort of some of the qualitative themes that we saw, not only in the post-assessment, but also in the debriefing. Um, so the themes that we recognized that were really powerful in terms of what students reported was how authentic or realistic uh, the simulation felt for them. I mean, there are some students who were like they were crying. They were they were just visibly moved by what what this was that they said it, it just felt very, very um, real to them. Um, they acknowledged that being um, poor and trying to survive in poverty is extremely stressful. Um, it's chaotic. They were overwhelmed um, that they were really frustrated at the system that they could arrive at social services and, and have to wait for a fairly long time and then be late getting 
their child picked up from childcare or daycare and how frustrating that was that they were always just trying to get out of a hole. Um, and then, you know, how empowered they felt as a reflection of this learning activity. Um, I, we, we sort of surveyed them about many assumptions and I chose three that I thought had the most sort of powerful um, responses um, that resonated with me. So the three assumptions that I thought were pretty powerfully changed was that being poor was a choice. I think a lot of people do work under an assumption that if you just work hard enough, then you don't have to be poor, that there's plenty of jobs out there. It's just a matter of, you know, applying yourself a little bit better. And after a result of this, when they experience this cycle of poverty, that no matter how hard they tried and how hard they worked, they couldn't get out of it, um, that that was a significant assumption that was really challenged for them. Um, another assumption was that society does enough to support poor people, that there's already a lot of government subsidies available for people living in poverty, that we shouldn't have to do more, that there's, it's, you know, we're already doing enough to support members of the society who are poor. Um, and that assumption was very, very greatly challenged as a result of this simulation um, the majority of the participants did not feel that way anymore, that felt that way prior. And then lastly, um, there was an assumption um, by, by many participants that um, poor people are lazy, that it's really just about being lazy. And as you can see, that had a pretty powerful impact as well. Um, so I think that this data, if nothing else, kind of shows us that experiencing things firsthand can have, at least if nothing else, it can sort of challenge some of those underlying assumptions that people didn't even realize they maybe had until they went through this. I'd also like to point out, and I don't have any data to capture this, but I would like to point out that one of the things I was initially worried about was that some of our students who had or still do experience um, the, the ramifications of living in poverty, that this could be very emotionally triggering for them. And um, I didn't want to have a learning activity in which um, a portion, any portion of our students felt that this like brought back any kind of prior trauma that they may have experienced. Um, so I was, I was very cautious about that. And we certainly in advance let students know that there would be um, several of us, including uh, Dr. Wharton and myself and some of the other faculty who are really invested in this, that we would be available to sort of talk and help them process any emotions that this simulation may have um, triggered in them. And what we found was that the students sort of self-disclosed during the debrief um, that they, some of them, that they had experienced poverty and they were so relieved that this was being taught to everyone, that they felt that most of society just doesn't get it, and that there was a lot of judgmental opinions and assumptions that existed, and they were really grateful that we um, made this a required activity um, in their first semester of nursing school, so that as they moved out into the community in a variety of um, clinical uh, rotations, that they that they all were kind of starting with, um, you know, this experience as a very grounding, um, you know, experience, experiential learning activity. So I, that was, that was a huge relief to me. And we've heard that can, that feedback consistently um, from people who have actually experienced poverty that participate in the sim, that it's realistic and that they're really relieved and grateful that this is an opportunity that um, their colleagues get to experience. Um, during our debriefing, um, I, I shared early on that there was a lot of really powerful discussions that came up. Uh, and so I chose just a few to be able to share with, with all of you. Um, you know, some of the things that students shared that were quite powerful was, um, I'm ashamed to admit how oblivious and probably judgmental I was, one student shared. Um, another one said, I, I genuinely felt the stress of how overwhelming it was. Um, and, you know, even children had such burdens to carry within their family units. 
Um, and then, you know, how this empowered people to want to become greater advocates for uh, vulnerable members of our community. Um, that, you know, that, that was a really powerful theme that uh, continues to come up while we debrief these. Um, and then, you know, having students kind of acknowledge um, some self-reflection about um, privilege and developing greater humility um, and how so much that they've taken for granted, um, you know, they want to kind of harness that to be able to make a difference um, in their community. So that's definitely just listening in on the, the debrief that is facilitated um, is, is pretty powerful. So at the, at the School of Nursing, we're really now um, to the point where we are expanding this to become a more interprofessional um, education. So this fall, we're going to be offering this simulation twice, um, October 26th and October 27th, in case anyone is interested to either observe or volunteer. Um, and if you have a group of uh, participants that you think would be interested, uh, we run this simulation uh, this fall, both of those dates, we will have somewhere between 50 and 75 participants. We've run this simulation with as few as 30 participants, um, and the small group did allow for some really in-depth discussion during the debrief about this. However, having a larger group uh, kind of more authentically simulates a really busy community with a lot of people trying to get groceries on their way home from work and, um, you know, the bank being too far off the bus loop that they have to just go to the quick cash center. Um, and that it's a lot easier to, um, you know, make some of these really hard choices that they didn't think they would make. So uh, this fall, we're looking to expand this. We have some members of the uh, law enforcement community who are interested in having some additional training. We have, um, we're um, looking to extend this to our colleagues in the School of Medicine. We'd like to have pharmacy students, um, social work students, um, you know, to, to really make this an authentic interprofessional learning. I think, you know, when we think about, um, you know, big problems to solve, it takes a really diverse group of people to come to the table to try to solve this. And I think if, if the first step that we took was having opportunities for people to experience this and think about how they can then implement it um, in, their, in their own areas, uh, you know, where, where each of you are, are working with either learners or clients or patients, um, that that's a good place to start. Um, so I'm going to just share a brief news clip, and then this pretty much concludes um, the, the, the slides that I had here. Uh, I know we have the breakout rooms to be able to discuss this is one thing I would love to be able to discuss with any of you. If you have questions, we will certainly take time for that. Uh, and I'd love to hear other ideas that folks have of how we can um, continue to expand this, uh, not just across our university, but throughout our community. So here's just a brief news clip where it highlights one of our students interviewing um, about their experience um, in the poverty zone. So. Poverty is a well-known issue here in Rochester with more than 30% of residents living below the poverty line. A local university is helping students tap into the challenges that this portion of the community faces. The University of Rochester School of Nursing launched a month-long poverty simulation for students in its accelerated bachelor's program for non-nurses. The school transformed an area of Helen Wood Hall into a small city where faculty and volunteers play the roles of different community members members, including police, landlords, and caseworkers. The simulation a aims to give students a deeper awareness of the barriers people living in poverty have to face every day. For many of us have probably experienced a form of poverty, um, or at least like some of that poverty culture, but given that 34 million people in the U.S. are in poverty right now, it's definitely eye-opening. Um, one thing I did notice is that bad luck happens to everybody, but when it happens to somebody who's in poverty, they have a lot less bandwidth. So things are harder for them than they are for the average person. So, All right, I'm going to go back to sharing my initial screen here.
All right. Um, yes, I ended the clip just a little bit early because you've just heard me talk for almost an hour. You didn't need to hear me talk about that there. So, um, so that is really the, the end of the presentation. Um, I hope that I've allowed enough time for us to have um, some questions. Uh, I know Dr. Wharton was going to, if you have questions, please um, submit them in the Q&A and we would be happy to um, you know, discuss and answer any of those that folks have. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much, Karen. We don't have any questions just yet. But I wonder if I could use a little bit of moderator privilege and ask a question or two myself, uh, just for, to round out things a little bit more. So the DICE series this year is focusing on the biopsychosocial model. And we've seen through the presentation how the poverty sim really addresses the social and a lot of the psychological elements. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this simulation prepares students to think more critically about the biological pieces. So. Uh, when people are coming in with either disease processes or if there are other things that are um, from the biological realm that impact their ability to either take care of themselves or may thrust them in and out of poverty in different ways. I know that we, we talk about it in the debrief, but I, I just wanted to um, wonder if you could provide a little bit more context into how that works its way into the poverty simulation experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that foundationally is one of the reasons we felt that we needed to do this so that our, our learners could really better understand how um, poverty really impacts health, wellness, well-being, right? So not just about life expectancy or, or quantity of life, but also quality of life. So, you know, we, we do a, a you know, our simulation program has really grown here at the School of Nursing. And, and, you know, this is one example, but all of our nurse practitioner students undergo a variety of um, OSCEs, right? So the objective structured clinical examinations. And from day one, it was always a priority here for us to make sure that every, uh, you know, patient encounter, generally these are with our standardized patients, um, that there is an element of, um, uh, social determinants of health so that uh, students could explore how not having access to preventative health care made them at much higher risk for, um, you know, developing uh, comorbid conditions or how certain members of the community uh, had a higher incidence of mortality from asthma or, or, you know, stroke, for example, risk of stroke just based on some of the socioeconomic factors um, that they are living in. So tying it back to the physical health, students do reflect, I mean, they, most of them do reflect in reflection assignments, depending on the course that they're taking, where they have to really reflect on the impact that some of these social factors uh, had on a person's uh, physical health as well. I don't know if that answered the question or not exactly, but. It does. Uh, we also have four questions that have come in, so I'm gonna try to hit them rapid fire for you. Uh, so the first one says, really fascinating effort. I'd be interested in getting this, uh, getting our engineering students involved. I wonder if you can comment on how important it is to do the windshield survey first. I find that really interesting. Yeah, so the, the windshield survey was, um, I, I will be very transparent that this whole um, activity arrived, you know, was one of the, the <laughs> was birthed out of COVID, right? So where necessity sort of helped to bring some creative thinking on how to get students out there because they weren't able to do typical community health kinds of rotations because of COVID. So doing a windshield survey was an opportunity to get students out into the community and doing assessments um, but without the, the barriers that existed um, due to COVID. And we found that even now that COVID isn't a barrier to our students being involved more in the community as it was two years ago when we, when we were starting this, that it's such a meaningful opportunity for them to be able to learn uh, a lot more firsthand, to be able to, to see that 
um, that that's something that we're not going to get we're not going to get rid of. It's just like telehealth. We started doing telehealth simulation out of a COVID necessity, and we've learned that telehealth is not going to go away. Um, and so it's an important concept for us to to teach all of our learners to get proficient um, with telehealth assessments. Excellent. The next comment and question uh, says, wow, thank you. Your mention of uh, return on investment, beautiful. Um, that students are left saying that they wanna make a difference. Do you offer ways for students to harness that intention, such as a list of resources or leads on how to take action and what to advocate for? Yeah, so we do, and I and I have to give credit to, um, you know, uh, a, a group at our school that really focuses on um, it's it's through Lyft, it's our Lyft program, and and so students are really able to. A, it's a student-led organization in which they can identify areas. So they are now, we're seeing much increased volunteer in um, community agencies such as homeless shelters. Um, Food Link um, is another one. Our students want to do food drives. Um, they do uh, so different organizations in the community that would benefit from donations and volunteers. Um, our students have become a lot more active in some of that. Of course, that can't be like a curricular expectation that, you know, we, we force them to do it, but they definitely have left very inspired to make more of those contributions, which is great. Excellent. The next uh, comment says, thank you for your presentation. Thinking about the intersection of poverty and age, I was wondering if any of your students reflected on the experience of poverty and aging. I'm wondering as well of the potential unintended effect of increasing ageism and the belief that aging is inherently full of suffering. That's a great question. Um, I think that there, there definitely was a lot of discussion around not just um, older adults, but how poverty affected people in at different ages or different phases of life in ways that they just didn't even anticipate. So how it impacted issues such as like um, routine uh, preventative care in younger children to during um, pregnancy and access to care and food and the stress and all of those impacts on the health of a uh, childbearing um, female. And then, into adulthood. And I think the older adult was sort of an, an eye-opening experience that, um, you know, older adults in the community um, don't want to be perceived as a burden. And so they're not often willing to ask for help from their kids or grandkids. And they may have even less um, opportunities to access some of the resources. Because if you think about if you don't have a phone or you don't have access to the internet, it may be hard to get some of those balls rolling. So they the students were able to identify ways that really different age um, members of the community, including older adults, um, could, you know, could really be, um, th their quality of life could be improved and helped as a result. Excellent. We have one more question. I'm not sure that we'll be able to answer it in the in the time, but I'll give it a shot. If we can't answer it here, then we'll answer it in the in the breakout session. And the comment says, this is a fantastic talk and an innovative approach to raising awareness about implicit biases and social, determin social determinants of health. I'm curious about whether the staff and faculty actors rotate in roles or do the same individuals participate each time. Relatedly, if new staff are recruited each time, are the pre-assessment data collected for them? And are their attitudes and assumptions changing in tandem with students? That is a great question. And I've got, what, 45 seconds to answer it. I think this would be great for our small group discussion that's going to come up um, after. But yes, we do collect the pre-assessment data and post-assessment data on the same groups of learners um, before and after each of the simulations. Um, I am looking and I, I may recruit the help of uh, Dr. Wharton uh, and his PhD expertise in helping me do a little bit more robust data collection since clearly I learned that it's not really my strength. Um, so uh, we're hoping to maybe be able to have some meaningful data to help use as a way for other people in the community to, to you know, wanna employ this since the return on investment may not be um, always quantifiable. 
I just want to say thank you to our speakers and to uh, the department, I mean, the School of Nursing. What a fantastic uh, presentation. And to remind everyone um, that there's CLE credits um, that are available and the evaluation link is in the is below. Um, also, if you're interested in the ICPM, I don't know if the link went out, but we'll put it in the chat right now as well. Um, and to let you know if you shared a computer with anyone, please reach out to Marilee Gremlin to inquire about education credits. Um, our next presentation is next Wednesday, put together by Neurology, Equitable Informed Biopsychosocial Spiritual Home in Neurology. Um, and now, if you'd like to join us for a breakout, they have been terrific conversations and I encourage everyone who can to join us for the next half hour. The link should be in the, the chat now.